Hello, Jeff Zwerink. Welcome to Give and Take, the segment of our show where we look at important scientific discoveries and how they support the truth of Christianity. Today, we're joined again by founder and president of Reasons to Believe, Dr. Hugh Ross. We're going to be investigating the prospect of scientists having found life on Venus. Hugh, it's good to have you here today. Well, thank you for inviting me. So Venus strikes me as one of the last places we want to go look for life. I mean, on the surface of Venus, uh, if you were to have a piece of paper there, it would spontaneously combust. It is so hot, assuming there's any oxygen around, which there isn't. So why in the world would we be thinking of looking for life on Venus? Well, astronomers have known for some time that the upper atmosphere of Venus is actually the most life-friendly location in our entire solar system beyond Earth. Because if you go about 60 kilometers up, you got up at temperatures about the same as the surface of the Earth. Uh, and the atmospheric density is roughly the same. Uh, so they're saying, hey, it's not great for life, but it's the best we're going to find outside of planet Earth. Anymore. It's actually better than Mars. Okay, so, so it's a, a reasonable place to at least go looking. And, and I know a, a number of months back there were some exciting discoveries that maybe there were hints of life there. Kind of describe what, what was the find and why does it point to life? Yeah, late in 2020, a, a group of astronomers says we have found uh, phosphine. They found the spectral signatures phosphine in the upper atmosphere of Venus. They were claiming to find it at about 20 uh, parts per billion. And they said, well, we know from what we see on Earth that phosphine is a residue from life. Mm -hmm. Therefore, maybe there really is life in the upper atmosphere of Venus. And I remember writing about it back then and saying, well, given the proximity of Venus to the Earth, it's possible that Earth life uh, got exported to the upper atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Maybe that explains it. But I was saying it'd be difficult to get 20 parts per billion. Well, yeah, kind of, in, uh, that's, I know, you know, it's like, obviously, if you've got a billion things, only 20 of them are phosphine, but kind of give a, is there a way you could put that in reference of how large or how small a number that is? Well, we're talking just 20 parts per billion. Right. And what also may be a little <laughs> suspicious at that time, Jeff, is it's difficult to make radio astronomy spectral measurements at that low of a level of abundance. Mm -hmm. So I remember reading the papers, and I wonder how large the error bar is. They claim to have an error bar as small as three parts per billion, but that's still only a factor of seven, uh, the signal above the noise. So I said, let's just wait and see. And literally within two weeks, a paper came out saying, we don't think that it's as high as 20 parts per billion, mm -hmm. and we think that they don't have a, a, uh, you know, an error bar as small as three parts per billion. Okay, so this is something where they found a, a reasonable signal, something that did look kind of like phosphine, uh, oh, but it's kind of at the boundary of, kind of at the boundary or the, the edge of the sensitivity of, of the telescopes, it sounds Correct. like. Correct. And moreover, there are other uh, chemicals that would give you a spectral line very close to what they thought was a phosphine line. That was the initial uh, critique. Mm -hmm. Maybe this isn't phosphine. Maybe you've misidentified the spectral line. Okay and maybe your signal to noise ratio isn't as good as what you say it is. That led to a flurry of papers, and uh, by about uh, six weeks ago, uh, basically there was a consensus, uh, we spoke too soon. Okay, uh, so, so what are some of the things that kind of weighed in that said, okay, this wasn't actually a measurement, or that they didn't actually find phosphine? Well, they basically showed, hey, this other spectral line is actually a more likely explanation of what you discovered. And the team that made the initial discovery basically redid their work and said, you know what, uh, we're, we weren't seeing 20 parts per billion. We were seeing maybe five parts per billion, maybe mm -hmm. only three parts per billion. Well, now you've got a signal to noise ratio that's like one and a half right. at best, and that's not publishable. So, so is so, this just a case of scientific hype where people are wanting to get stuff published to get a name, or is I, give us a little background on what you think of, is this good science or not? Well, a signal to noise ratio of seven is publishable. Mm -hmm. And that's what they had initially. They thought it was 40 parts per billion. Right. But before they published, they put it down to 20. But, you know, if their signal, if their noise is three parts per billion, that's publishable. And they wrote in their article why they thought it was phosphine and not another spectral line. But what, but they, and they made their data publicly available, mm -hmm. which I thought was really good. Was, and they basically said, hey, if you want to reanalyze our data, go for it. Well, people did that. 
They took the identical data they had, they reanalyzed it and said, we don't think we're finding phosphine here. So, so th this actually sounds like really good scientific process. Hey, we've got this interesting result. We can't find an error. Let's put it out there and let people look. I mean, that's kind of the heart of the scientific method, if you will. So. It is, and the very discovery team said, you know what? We're going to do our homework, too. We're going to redo it. And when they redid it, they said, uh, it's not coming out like we thought at first. So this is an example of good science. Mm -hmm. And that's happening more and more, especially in astronomy and physics where they actually make publicly available all their data, also make publicly available their analytical methods, so people can basically say, hey, let's redo this and see if we get the same outcome. So, so this is, uh, you know, I mean, obviously the interest in looking for phosphine is that it's a signature of life, and the question of is there life out in the cosmos beyond Earth is obviously a very big one. Um, what do you think are the prospects of finding life beyond Earth? Well, let me just preface this by saying one of the outcomes was they're saying phosphine may not be the signature of life that we think it is. There's sure. other ways to get phosphine. <laughs> That's a fair point, yes. It is. On the other hand, I think uh, you know this is worth pursuing because within our solar system, given how abundant life is on Earth, we would expect to find the remains of Earth life on the Moon, on Mars, in the upper atmosphere of Venus. We know it's there just because of the number of meteoritic strikes Earth has taken. I'd be surprised if it... So, so meteoritic strikes, some meteor hits Earth, sprays life, sprays stuff from Earth out into the cosmos or out into the solar system. Right. Okay, so it's just transporting Earth life other places. Just like we have about. Martian meteorites on the surface okay. of the Earth, there's Earth meteorites on the surface of Mars. Right. And they're going to take with it the remains of Earth life. So it's simply inevitable we're going to find the remains of life on other solar system bodies besides the Earth. And if it's from the Earth, we would predict you're going to find a much bigger signature in the Moon than you will on Venus, and a bigger signature in Venus than you would on Mars. So if you get those ratios back, that tells you, hey, it's just mm. Earth life as opposed to indigenous life. So um, do you think, I, I think that's a fascinating thing that, we, you know, we, there's this idea that if we find life on other planets, all that means that naturalism is true, if you will. Uh, and so really, the, even within a Christian framework of God only creating life here, there's, there's other ways to account for that. Do you think it's possible that God created life somewhere else in the universe? Well, that's been debated for 2,000 years by Christians, and you've had people basically evenly divided, saying, God seems to really like creating. Why is he going to stop on just one planet? This is a big universe, after all. And given how much fun he has creating, he's probably done it in many other places. Let's go see if we can find it. Other Christians have argued, you know, God seems to have a purpose for creating the universe, Earth, and Earth's life. And from their theological perspective, God only needs to do the creation on one body to achieve the state of purpose we see in Scripture, which is to redeem free will beings unto himself. Uh, so they would argue, well, maybe God created grass on another planet, or microbes, or fish. Uh, but in terms of spiritual beings in need of redemption, they would argue this is probably the only place. Uh, and then that leads to debate. Uh, maybe Jesus goes to other planets. <laughs> so, so it sounds like Christians have talked quite a bit about this. It it's not that new. They've been talking <laughs> about it for 2,000 years. So. Well, thanks, thanks a bunch of you. I appreciate your comments. You know, the question of, is there life beyond Earth? That's a question that has fascinated people forever. It wouldn't surprise me if Adam and Eve were arguing about that in the Garden of Eden. Uh, it's one that Christians have thought a lot about, and though this particular signature of life maybe in Venus atmosphere didn't pan out, it's a question that's going to go on for a long time. You know, I would encourage you to go to reasons.org, check out Hugh's blog on this topic, Life Signature in Venus's Atmosphere, Genuine or Not. Also go check out my book, Is There Life Out There? It will give you great resources to be able to understand the scientific ideas behind that, but also appreciate just how fascinating a question it is scientifically as well as theologically and how useful it is for engaging conversations about the gospel.